Hey everyone, it's Jake Hall, the Manufacturing Millennial. Um, we are here at Realize Live 2024, as many of you know, out in the crowd, and I am with the one and only Del Costi, president of Siemens Digital Industries and Automation. Del, it's always a pleasure to have you. Thank you for uh, taking some time to talk. It's good to see you again, Jake. Absolutely, it did feels you, like- Did you say one and only? The one and only. And this is recorded so I can send it to my wife and son? I can. All right, I, I, I will personally get you that audio bite. I appreciate it, thank you. <laughs> so, um, it's been a busy year so far. You've been traveling a lot. I've been traveling a lot. We just met last week in Chicago for Automate 2024. That was a big event. You were uh, one of the keynotes. You gave a great presentation covering a lot of different solutions and that, that are happening in terms of digital solutions, software, AI, bringing new technology into the manufacturing and automation industry. And um, I kind of want to encompass through more conversations some follow-up topics that you highlighted and you talked about when it comes to Siemens strategy and, and really what your goals are for, for transforming this industry in the future. So really what I, what I want to kick off with is when we look at Siemens and, and, and the evolution that Siemens has had, especially over the last 5, 10, 15 years, when it comes to driving more digital solutions into automation, can you talk more about how the industry is changing when it comes to bringing more diverse verticals into the industry, such as like automotive, transportation, heavy equipment. Why, why is Siemens changing? It's a, it's a great question, but I, 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 did, I did love last week at Automate, and uh, you and I had a chance to talk there, and you got to love the plugs for Detroit that uh, yep. I had in my presentation. So that Absolutely. Was, I always love plugging my hometown. Um, but, you know, the manufacturing thing is in the blood of the hometown that mm -hmm. I came from, and so I grew up immersed in that space. One of the things that I highlighted was what's happened for Siemens since 2007 when it acquired that software company, UGS. And yeah. at the time, it was the largest software acquisition in history. So it was, a, it, was a, a very, it was a visionary move from Siemens, and I think you could see what has happened since. There's been a multitude of acquisitions, and... Um, if I take it back to the manufacturing side, Jake, I think what we see, if you go back, companies designed their end-to-end -end enterprise around, I'm, 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 I'm going to make a product, I'm going to make a product a very specific way, and I'm going to make a lot of it. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, you had companies that had very unique product that they said, I'm going to make the best product that's going to be individualized. Well, what did that mean for manufacturing? If I'm going to mass produce a product that's common, Yep. I'm going to put all my emphasis and, un emphasis and understanding everything about manufacturing digitally. I'm going to know how my machines are going to build, be built. I'm going to know how the lines operate. I'm going to know how material flows through the facility. Because it's like NASCAR, right? Any, any bit I can take off, yeah, I'm going to improve in a big way. Well, contrast that to a company that's making unique product. Uh, they emphasized all the digital footprint on the design side. And the operations were very manual. Well, what have we seen? All these industries are facing a, a significant convergence. The mass production, I need indiv individualization of my product, yeah. right? So that model's changed. And on the, on the one-off scenario where I'm making unique tail, tail number in air, as an airframer, yeah, but I still need automation now because of the complexity, supply chain disruptions. I need to be able to automate those processes. So we're seeing a real convergence in a multitude of industries. And what, what, what does that lend itself to? I need to be as digital as possible. So when we look at becoming more digital, it's, it's really, I would say, the next stepping stone for one, doing a better job democratizing automation, two, giving a lot of companies, especially here in the US, a competitive advantage again when it comes to making products more efficiently, faster at a lower cost, and more sustainable, which is another big topic that we're highlighting. So when we look at the general amount of manufacturing facilities across the U.S., many of them are brownfield facilities. We're, 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 we're bringing new manufacturing facilities and green facilities into the U.S., but when we look across the board with general manufacturing, it's still very much a brownfield um, process. So how do we go about making sure that as we adopt new technology, we don't disrupt what we're currently already, already doing? And then what's the best practice or, or are there best practices to avoid disruption within manufacturing as we bring digital solutions? Yeah, I mean, I love the phrase best practices, but the reality is they're always evolving, right? Um, and so every time you go do an implementation, you have to learn from that implementation. Mm -hmm. 
and modify and, and optimize that best practice? It's a great question, and that's a lot of what I focused on last week was the brownfield challenge. Uh, we know when you go clean sheet and you can plan an operation from ground up, you can get super efficient. You can leverage the latest and the greatest. It's interesting, though, when you, when you bring sustainability into it. We talked about it today, that 80% of your environmental impact is determined in design phase. That's why I think Siemens has such a unique position in the market because we understand the design phase, but we also understand the manufacturing operation, execution and operations. So if I take the brownfield challenge, I think there's massive opportunity. And we talked about a, a couple of cases, but uh, we have the opportunity to take existing lines in their existing state, and there's capability out there to instrument each of those machines, each of those operations, broadcast that information, and apply those tools on top of whatever that set of capabilities are today. And so we've been doing that effectively, and as a matter of fact, one of the main drivers was sustainability. So we have a couple of customers we're working with and we're instrumenting all their operations. Um, we're giving them the ability to reduce data collection by 80, 90%. And it's allowing them to actually drive real insight into what they need to do to modify production. And at the same time, instrumenting everything, getting that broadcast data out in a way they never had it before, and still saving 10% on energy cost. These are significant opportunities, and done in a short period of time. This isn't a project that took three years. This is a project that was done in six months, right? And so we keep building off of that now and looking at methods to, let's say, you know, optimize and update energy meters and, and look at different things we can do, but not impacting production at all. And I look at, there was, there was a great kickoff last night with, with Tony talking about those solutions, and it really opened up my mind when it comes to interconnected digital solutions across the board. Um, I, I spent a few years doing some CAD work, and, and when I saw when one process was changed here, and then immediately all this interconnected data affected, and it was immediately updated across simulation, across BOM purchasing, across materials, across how this would affect other stuff, it goes to show how time to market is really affected when it comes to designing products and solutions. And we talked we talk about how sustainability was 80% factor with when it comes to when you're designing products ahead of time. But I think about the, the reduction of risk when it comes to driving digital solutions is massive. You know, so, so when we look at moving forward, and, and I want to talk more about, you know, in sustainability. Sustainability a lot of times can be a controversial topic by a lot of people, and, and especially when it comes to people saying, oh, when we're, when we're implementing, we're focusing on sustainability, it's going to hurt our productivity. It's gonna hurt our competitive advantage. But when I'm learning more now, when we're driving digital solutions to push sustainability, it says, no, it's actually one of those things when you design things in a positive mindset, it actually can benefit you long-term. What, what are you seeing with that? hundred percent. You, you, when you just phrased that, you talked about reduction of risk. I would say the improvement of innovation, acceleration of innovation, that's what these systems allow you to do. And sustainability is one, one element. Aaron did a really nice job today talking about, you know, just look at the way nature behaves and interacts. There's a lot to be learned there. Uh, what I love about even the example you gave, there's an in a relationship of everything you do in the product design, but Tony talks about, and one of his slides had the phrase comprehensive digital twin. Um, that's an important concept because for us, a comprehensive digital twin doesn't just represent the CAD design or a model-based engineering, uh, a model-based enterprise. It's far more than that. Uh, when we talk about comprehensive digital twin, we're talking about the bill of materials definition, that, that electric, electronic bill of materials, the CAD bomb alignment, but we're also talking about the bill of process definition. When I have that bill of process definition, I have a seamless flow to manufacturing execution. When I have that, I have that seamless flow to the systems, the operational systems on the shop floor. This is a continuous set of data that can flow and we, 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 we monitor how it flows through our digital thread maturity. All that leads to our ability to simulate effectively and I think this is what you and I hit on last week. Real efficiency is gonna come from what you can do at the edge. I mean, make no mistake. You're, doing, you're, you're having that down payment on everything you're doing so that I can process information effectively at the edge. Why? 
I'm going to collect terabytes and terabytes of data on my shop floor. We all know that the majority of data, the, the, the huge amount of data creation that all manufacturing plants across the U.S. generate, across, across the world, what are we going to do with that data? Are we going to just kind of put it in a data lake and get to it? We need to process it at the edge. We need to understand what data is, ha as it's flowing through, can I interrogate, can I seize things real time? Because I have a trained model that understands that something's off. If I have a, a, an AI-based visual system, what am I seeing? Is it a supplier issue coming in? Do I have a process that's slightly off? Maybe I have a design issue I need to consider. We're gonna, with these tools, with having this mapped out appropriately, we're gonna be able to solve those problems at the edge. That's gonna drive significant efficiency. And that's something we can all be excited about. The last thing I'd say is sustainability is good business. Uh, it's not about just latching onto it. Uh, and Aaron said it, look, you still have to design the most innovative products that consumers are gonna want. You have to be able to build them in a cost-effective way that consumers are gonna be willing to pay for. But at the same time, consumers are gonna demand that they're sustainable. All in all, it's just good business. It's the more efficient use of resources. It's considering how that product will be dealt with after its life. You know, it, to me, this is all about just being good stewards of the Earth's resources. There's nothing wrong with that, and it could be good business. It reminds me of, uh, and you know this from Detroit, um, Henry Ford, when he, you probably know the exact story I'm going to tell already, Henry Ford, back when he was working with suppliers, what, demanded a, a common, was a common product or a common size shipping container that all the product was shipped in? Is that, is that right? And then, and then what was that product then? It was used into like the floorboards of the car or something like that? Is, is that what so, it was? So the, the original circular economy. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think about that too. I talked to a customer last week and we talked about just material flow through their facilities. And you know, we can't even take that for granted. Uh, if we drive me, uh, lean manufacturing principles in our operations, we know exactly how many individual parts we want to keep at the line side for assembly. We know how we want to store them in the facility. Then you could trace that back to how many sit on a truck, what dock do they come in so I can reduce traffic on the shop floor. But they're all being delivered in containers and dunnage. Have we optimized the way the dunnage and container is designed? Is it something that's leverageable throughout the whole supply chain? Or are we just going to scrap all that and have to get rid of it? These are all things that we can look at and do. But that's when we have this comprehensive digital twin, these are initiatives that we can kick off because we could do it all digitally. You've been at Siemens for many years. I think it's 20, 24 years? No, no, no. <laughs> 24 years, correct? 2001. Yeah. 2001. And, and during that time, you worked within product development, you worked in, in manufacturing, and you truly have seen then the, the transformation of, of digital adoption within manufacturing from the beginning. So the next question I have is, when it comes to driving digital adoption within manufacturing companies, what's the best process for overcoming that risk or those or those hurdles that we that we face. I want to start with a quote of a friend of mine who uh, is CEO of a very large company in Detroit. And, and first meeting uh, outside of knowing him from other stuff uh, in his CEO role, he said, "Listen, let me be perfectly clear. You're you're in the software field, which is great, but there's only one door that matters to me, and it's the shop. It's the shop floor door, uh, which you know I thought was interesting to set that tone that." We build products, but ultimately those products are needed by someone else, and we have to get those products out that shop floor door on time and on schedule, and for the price we committed to. That's an interesting context to think about in terms of where we are today, because when I was doing this 20 years ago, companies were interested in digital technologies. They needed them, but they would consume them in the areas they knew they needed them. They wouldn't necessarily make it part of a boardroom discussion about how we're gonna dig digitalize the enterprise. That's changed. I don't think there's a board in the world that isn't challenging leadership on what is your digital strategy? Where are you in terms of maturity and where are you taking this to leverage these tools? And Tony said it, you know, Tony's been around a while. He's been our CEO for, for quite a while on the DI software side. Um, and he said, look, I've seen things come, I've seen them get hyped up, but AI is different. AI is different. 
Um, the question is, can you leverage the full power of AI? Do you have enough knowledge of your product design, your process definition, and your production facilities to really harness the power of it? Because you've seen it's a lot of co-pilot capability, yeah. but they're not all going to be created equal. So, so let's talk about co-pilot AI. Let's talk about AI as, as this next tool to push digital transformation forward. During the keynote presentation in Automate, first time I've seen it, I, I envision, I, I remember talking with a friend um, a year and a half ago when ChatGPT and OpenAI first came out and you were taking these prompts and you were getting generative text backs. And we, and, and, and ca in casual conversation, we were like, when do you think we could then create a generative text and PLC code would be generated from that? And we were, we were joking, ah, there's no way, you know, it's not going to happen. There's too much stuff. And then not even a year and a half later, during your keynote, you pull up this presentation talking about your partnerships, and, and there you go. You open up Copilot AI along with Siemens, and, you, and a generative text is given saying, hey, I want to create a new rung of information, I think it was, where you, where you copied over some basic syntax with, within a model, and then, boom, it created ladder logic code. You know, it, what was that like, you know, when, when you're going up there, giving that presentation, and literally I heard gasps in the audience of, you know, a thousand people watching. What was that like for that? Well, it was funny because every, everyone I talked to from our organization that was in the crowd, they're like, just instantly went to the punchline. They're like, oh, my gosh, you should have saw the reaction when that, when that was playing up on, on screen. It was incredible. Um, and, and when you and I spoke, there was folks waiting out to talk yeah. about yeah, uh, how, they, how they'd seen that. And... and Everyone's been thirsting for it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this, this wave hit us with, it, with AI not that long ago. I mean, you think about how, how uh, rapid this evolution has been, but this is real value, right? I mean, so when you look at the Siemens Industrial Copilot, and that, in that case for engineering, which is up front, the fact that I can interact with this model and I can say, hey, help me do this. I want to add a function. I want to add a process. And it says, okay, well, you know, what do you want to add? And you give it a basic description. And we showed it as cut and paste. We didn't even need to. That just could have been voice, right? I, and it could have went out and it could have found that data and it could have pulled it in and said, this is what I'm going to look to do. Okay, yeah, that looks good. By the way, update this, 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 uh, this header for me. Well, it's going to find, it's going to update that header. Every, I mean, you know what it would take to do that manually today, right? That massive time savings. And then... I want, to add a, I want to add a step in a process to improve quality. I need to go do some rework here. And boom, it's done for you. That's on the design side or the engineering side for the industrial co-pilot. Take the Siemens industrial co-pilot for operations. Now I'm noticing behavior that's a little off on the plan and I can actually interact vocally. I can, I can have a discussion and say, hey, what's going on with you, machine? You know, what, what's happening? And, I can get that iteration. These are real values. And you know, you think about global deployments, you think about, you know, here, you look at AI, you saw the Sony headset. Imagine the world. I, I did a panel for one of our large customers and I was asked, you know, these technologies are evolving fast, what do you see in five years? And I said, you know, honestly, I can give you a very technical answer. I'm not going to. What I see is I see an elimination of barriers between functions and companies and cross companies. I can interact with data, I can interact with systems and I can say, experiencing supply chain disruptions here, Gen AI helped me figure out, and, and it will, and if, if Gen AI, is, if, if I have this digital thread built up appropriately and I've got my data where it needs to be and I interact with Gen AI, if I'm discovering an issue, if I'm experiencing an issue on the shop floor, Gen AI is going to help me determine, is it, like I said earlier, is it a supply chain issue? Is it a production issue? Did I define a bad process? Is my machine faltering where it's impacting the quality of my parts? Or did I design something in a suboptimum way? Gen AI is not going to care about function. It's going to understand data. It's going to be able to iterate on that data, and it's going to learn. So I, I think the future is bright. I, I think it's, it's tremendously exciting. There was a a conference I spoke out in Colorado Springs about a month ago, and it was a group of about 150 forging companies in the US. And one of the biggest worries across that entire leadership team of all these different forging companies was an aging workforce and a new workforce that comes and doesn't have the tribal knowledge to address, address issues on the processing and the manufacturing floor. 
And I remember seeing a demo when I was walking through the, the solutions area here at Realize Live. And there's a co-pilot solution that's plugged into a machine that's giving them real-time you know, instructions and, and, and things for an operator to check who's not familiar with that machine. And I always look at, when you look at the millennial generation that I'm a part of, the average millennial will have 11 to 13 different jobs by the age of 30 years old. So how does a manufacturing company reduce the risk of their training and their workforce when they can train a person, they don't know if they're gonna stay in there for longer than six months. And I look at how do companies create a more structured, you know, robust, reduced risk manufacturing process. And I look at the technology like that with AI and I'm thinking, man, that's just the most logical direction to go is, is you can go out there and you don't need that 25 year experienced person to address a machine issue, to, to address a condition monitoring or when preventative maintenance comes up and you got to go through this 25, 26 page process of inspection. Now all of a sudden you have a, a trainable systematic guide, which is AI to, a, to guide you through that process. And like for me, that's just, it's exhilarating. It is, and uh, again, after Automate, I, I spent time at a, an American Makes facility in Chicago. Great dialogue about the future workforce. There's a few ways we could go with that conversation alone. Um, I'm fascinated by what you said, but I, 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 I pivoted a little bit because yes, there are great opportunities to leverage the way we do things today in Gen AI to help train the next generation workforce. But I would also tell you, when you do something with a knowledge base, you tend to focus on the idea of incremental gain. How can I improve incrementally? When you look at it differently, I can, I can flip the script completely. I can, look at, I can look at absolute new methods of doing things. And when we do have this big changeover in the workforce, I did talk about this on stage a little bit in that uh, I don't know that we have the love for manufacturing now that we had 30 years ago. We need it back. And if, if, if we look at our next generation workforce and their comfort with tools, I think it's a significant opportunity for us to rebrand what manufacturing is because I think it's gonna be one of the most advanced areas to work. These technologies are gonna be on the shop floor. Do you need to be programming for a software company in the West Coast or East Coast? Or can you be through the heartland of the United States leveraging advanced technology globally, actually, not just the United States. This technology is obviously global. So, but we can kind of revamp this approach to manufacturing that this is going to be a tech-led set of capabilities, right? You're going to be able to interact and diagnose how things can be improved. It's an exciting opportunity. And, and when you look at manufacturing's perception for years being this dark, dirty, dull, dangerous, dumb, you know, industry, it's one of those things where our parents warned us not to go into it. Our guidance counselors warned us not to go into it. The general, you know, you could say educational system from different points said, no, don't go into manufacturing. There's so many other opportunities that exist. And so right now, when you look at where future Gen Zs, which are currently in high school and to graduate, they want to go into a STEM career. But I think manufacturing is often not viewed as part of that, that STEM career, but when you look at what's happening through digital solutions, AI adoption, automation and technology, bringing robotics to the thing. There, there, was, a, there was a video um, that, that Siemens did in partnership with NVIDIA on opening up the world's first digital factory. And I remember watching that video and I'm thinking, this isn't just an animation. This is a real-time simulation of manufacturing processes where you could just make changes and see real-time change on what would happen. And I'm thinking, like, what young kid who grew up watching all these movies, who grew up playing video games, who grew up making their own 3D printer and learning how to draw some basic CAD and then print something, like, how does that not excite them to say, wow, I can take what I'm passionate about and what my hobbies are, and now manufacturing is a direct representative of what new technology means. Well, and the other parallel I would tell you when you look at those videos, uh, you look at the industrial metaverse, and as you said, truly physics-based, it's, 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 it's taking that real-time data off the shop floor and showing you 
in the industrial metaverse. You notice how clean those floors are? Yeah. That's also real. Like people, people, like you said, they used to think these dirty, dingy jobs. They haven't walked a shop floor lately because I'll tell you what, you could eat off the floor in a lot of them. I mean, people got with the program. Manufacturing operations are clean, they're efficient, uh, they're well organized, and it is a great place to be. And I, again, I think the upside potential is tremendous. And I love uh, those opportunities. I ended, uh, you know, we, we, we had Fryer speak here, and I thought he did a marvelous job. Uh, excellent. And you saw, you saw the industrial metaverse, and that was a huge advantage for the way they were approaching uh, battery production, and he talked about it. So that was, that was refreshing to hear. When, when I ended uh, my discussion at Automate, I showed the fact that Siemens uses this same capability before it does anything, whether it's launch a greenfield or, or update a brownfield, Siemens is using the industrial metaverse to do it. Um, why guess when you go in to make expensive changes on the shop floor, when I can not only have it validated with simulation, but I can see how it's actually gonna run with real code. That is powerful stuff. So what is exciting you most about the future when it yes. comes? <laughs> Many things, many things, you know, and maybe you can't narrow it down to one, but when you look at the, the way we used to do manufacturing and with Siemens strategy for, for, for bringing on all these digital solution companies on board for the last 10, 15 years, when we look at that graph, what is exciting you most about what the future has in store for, for, for automation and digital solutions? I would tell you it goes to kind of what I alluded to, uh, I feel like we're at, a, we're at a point in time here where the art of the possible truly is the art of the possible. I feel like we talked about the art of the possible before and it was what I said earlier, it's the art of the incremental. I don't think that has to be the case anymore. I, I have the privilege of this job of working with some of the largest, most successful companies in the world, but I also get to work with a lot of startups. And I watch the very large companies I work with study the startup community because Hey, it's, it's like launching a greenfield versus fixing a brownfield. Startups have that, have that ability and they can go test some ideas and you start to see the close collaboration between the startup community and, and, and these large, very successful companies. Imagine harmonizing all that, right? I mean, the rate of innovation with these tools now, it's, it's just so exciting. And, and it's such a privilege getting to represent all of digital industries because I see it on the product design side. I see that level of innovation. I see companies that are coming up with ideas. You know, we have a company here that, that I, I love what they've done. They've, they've decided, hey, I'm gonna, take, I'm gonna take water out of my products. Why ship water, right? And so I have massive heavy product. And if I eliminate the water from it, the product is gonna perform the same way when you get it. But guess what? It got to your door with a significantly reduced carbon footprint. And there's so many innovative ideas that impact so many ele elements of our lives. And, and again, I think we can do things smarter, faster, less expensive, much better consumption of resources. And I hate the fact that I drive, the few of the routes I drive at home, I'm driving by these massive landfills. That doesn't have to be what our future looks like we can get much smarter about what we put in our products. I, I will tell you this, I got the opportunity to walk a, uh, an aircraft carrier before it was commissioned. And I was walking this unbelievable uh, uh, ship. And then I'm walking around and I'm seeing, I'm seeing all these people that are getting ready to go out and deploy. And I'm like, younger than my son, you know? Um, but it hit me, and, you know, there's gonna be three, 4,000 people on this thing. And I'm like, they get fed four times a day. So think about this. Everything is so well thought out that the way the food ends up on the ship, it's, it's packaged a very specific way. They have to process all that waste. But they've designed it from the get-go, understanding that use case, and they create almost no waste, and they deal with it in a way that is good for the overall ecosystem and keeps everyone fed. So again, we have the capabilities to solve problems far more innovatively than we, we have, and, and, and I think our future is going to allow us to do that. I, I think that's such an excellent highlight. When you look at the, the digital discussion happens oftentimes at the end 
of a manufacturing process. How do we go about changing so we can make companies better understand the importance of it happening at the beginning? Um, you know, a lot of times it's when companies are first exploring digital solutions, it's oftentimes when they already have machines and equipment and processes running on the floor, but there's new products being developed every single day. There's new lines being installed every single day. How do we do a better job driving the digital discussion up front when we're doing things? It, I will tell you this, it, Jake, it's happening because honestly, like sustainability, it's good business. The fact is, you're, you know, in most cases, you're building a product, you're gonna keep building that product, you're gonna improve on that product. Having the knowledge of what I built the first time, what did I learn about that, what did my consumers like or not like about it, how do I modify the design going forward? Having that digital footprint, having that comprehensive digital twin, allows me to make the next generation product better. You have to do that in today's business. You, it's, it's, it's gonna be, close to impossible to survive without it. Awesome, so we're wrapping up our conversation. I have time for one more. And uh, you get interviewed on many panels, many discussions, you give many presentations. What is the question that you wish you would be asked more often, or that you wish you would have been asked, but you have not yet? What would that be? Are you an introvert or an extrovert? Because I'm an introvert, so it's tough for me. Uh, <laughs> my wife says she's an introvert. She's the most <laughs> extroverted person you'll ever meet. Um, that's a great question. I've never been asked that one. I would, I, would have to, I would have to say it goes to what I alluded to earlier. I don't know the proper way to phrase the question, but I think it would be how do we get out of the realm of driving for incremental gain and look for what real opportunity is? I, I think that's a topic that's worth discussing more. Um, I think co some companies have figured it out and, and, and they figure out a way to do true innovation teams. And the fact is innovation is taking a really good idea and making it a bit better. Sometimes it creates new markets. But again, I, I, I think as we talked about, we have an opportunity to do pretty amazing things. What's the footprint of manufacturing going to be in the future? Is it going to be distributed? I don't know. But when we think about the amount of product that moves across seas on freight, does that really need to be the future? I, I really like having those conversations about what are the opportunities of the future. So it'd probably be something around on those lines. Awesome. Well, Dell, we really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you all for the audience who listened. We appreciate it. Uh, but Dell Costi, president of Siemens Digital Industry and Automation. Thanks so much. So this is two weeks in a row. I'll be in Brazil next week. So yeah, I, 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 I won't see you in Brazil next week. This is my time for travel off. I, 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 we'll have to catch up another time later this year. Thanks, Jake. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.